Good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon. We got another video Sunday school for you here today. Hope you like it. We got something fun to do. So I hope you know by now. But whenever we do Sunday school, get your Bible ready because we're going to use it. Why do we always use our Bible? Because if we weren't teaching from the Bible, we wouldn't have anything to talk about, would we? Yeah. Nothing else is reliable as the Bible. So we have been talking about the two kingdoms for quite a while. And now both of them have gotten so bad, God had to head, send in and send another country in and take over. So Assyria, the great big army of Assyria, came in and took over the northern part of Israel, the part they actually called Israel, invaded their cities, captured some of their people, took them back to other places, and they got people from the other countries they took over and brought them in. And then the Babylonians did the same thing to the southern kingdom, just several generations later. So right now, Jerusalem has been destroyed. The city's been invaded. A lot of the people have been taken captive back to other lands. And people from other countries have been moved in. And all the good stuff that was value, like all the treasures that were in the temple, all the good stuff that was in the king's house and the prince's houses, that's all been taken away. And some of the people have been taken away too to live in different places. And we've been talking about some of those people. Do you remember who we talked about last week was one of those people? Yeah, it was Daniel. He was just a boy at the time he got taken. Maybe 12, 16, maybe as old as 20. Okay, a young guy. And he got taken away from his mother and his father and from his hometown. Everything he knew. And where'd they take him? A long way away. Back to Babylon. The capital city of the Babylonian Empire. And he went to school there to learn to be a great Babylonian leader. That was the king's plan. Get people from the other countries. Teach them to be leaders. And let them lead the different places. And that way he can kind of keep his whole empire together. All right. So we're going to start in that story again today. Last time we talked about the first chapter of the book of Daniel. So I got the handy dandy Bible chart. All right. We've already talked about all the books Moses wrote. And we've talked about the stuff that happened in the book of Judges. Joshua and Judges and Ruth. And we talked about the stuff that happened in the Samuels, the Kings and the Chronicles. All right. And these stories are actually in the Major prophet section, and it's the book of Daniel. So hopefully if you got your Bible, we've got to go to Daniel chapter 3. Now there's a real interesting story in chapter 2 I wish we had time to teach. But we've got to skip that, and we're going to go to two other stories today, all right? And we're going to see that God is still showing his glory, even though he had to punish that old country of his that he set up. He's still showing his glory. We're going to see that in two different ways today. The first way I am calling the difficult situation. All right. So in chapter three there, let's see how the situation started. Now, if you remember, Daniel had three friends that were Hebrew boys, came in there the same time he went to to go to that leader school that they were at for three years. Their names was Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. All right, but the Babylons didn't like those names. Remember why? Because they all talked about their God. Remember, Daniel says, name means God is my judge. Hananiah's name means God is gracious. Michelle's name means who is like God. And Azariah means God has helped. Babylonians didn't like that. So they had to give them new names. Daniel got called Belteshazzar. We might actually see that if we read the right verses today. Which means Bel, protect the king. And Bel is the name of one of those false gods. Hananiah got named to Shadrach. Which means inspired of Aku. Aku, another one of those false gods that the Babylonians worship. Michal got changed to Meshach. Which means who is like Aku. Instead of who is like God, they changed that. Put their own fake God's name in there. Did you see that? And then Azariah, who was God has helped, 
It got changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nugu. And again, guess what Nugu is? Another one of those false gods the Babylonians worshipped. Okay? So they've been through school now. They've graduated. They've been put in positions of leadership there in Babylon. And the story we're going to jump into here in chapter 3, Daniel isn't in it. Even though Daniel wrote this book, he's not in this story. We don't know why. Maybe he was busy on one of his jobs or something. Okay? So he wasn't at this event. Let's read about the event. We're going to start right with verse 1 of chapter 3. Okay? And see how this difficult situation came along. So I hope you're with me. Daniel chapter 3 verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, he's the king of Babylon, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. So somewhere just outside of the capital city, King Nebuchadnezzar set up this big image. Now if we translate, it said three score cubics there, all right? If we translate that into something we know, that's 90 feet tall. Anybody know how, 90, how tall 90 feet is? Most of you aren't 90 feet tall, are you? No, I don't think so. I'm not 90 feet tall. Even my big tall son, Edward, he's not 90 feet tall. No. 90 feet tall is like an eight-story building. We don't have too many of those buildings that tall here in Elkhart County. Maybe a couple downtown Elkhart. The water towers might be around 90 feet around here. Okay. This was a big, impressive image that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do. Now, what did he do after he put this image up? Because he had a plan. All right. If you look at verse 2, I won't read it. But take a look yourself there, okay? And he gathered several people. You'll see the word prince in there and judges. You'll see treasurers and counselors listed in there. He got his top government officials, which is why Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah were here because they worked for the government. They were government officials to some level or another. All right? So they got called here too. So it's not too much of a problem. Today... People that do this, they would call it team building. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to put together a team. Yeah, yeah, you see, going out, taking over other countries, yeah, that's all good and fine for the king. But running the country, now that's complicated. And he needed all the help he wanted, and he needed a good king, a, a good team to do that. So he wants to make a great king, all right? So, so far, there's no real big problem. But here's where we get the difficult situation, all right? We're going to read it. We're going to look at Daniel, verses 4 and 6. Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 and 6. And a herald cried aloud. You know, back then they didn't have PA systems. So they'd hire these guys to go around and yell out what they wanted said. This is one of those guys, okay? To you it is commanded, O people of nations and languages meaning everybody that's there. <coughs> At what time you hear the sound, okay, here's the band, cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So what was this event? This event was to get everybody there, and they would play their music, and then everybody's supposed to worship the king's image. Now we don't know whether this thing was supposed to look like him or look like one of his gods, but he wanted everybody to worship his image. What's the plan? Okay? What if you didn't? Well, there was a threat there. All right? Let's look at verse 6. See? Well, let's go back. What about our three guys here? What do we know about them? We know they were trying their best to worship their God. The true God, the God of Israel, the God that made heaven and earth and Adam and Eve and did all these wonderful things to get the Jews raised under Abraham and then into Egypt and then back out of Egypt with Moses and set up the judges and the kings and all that stuff God's been working with them. They want to worship just the true God and not the false gods in Babylon. That's what we know about them. 
So what do you think they were thinking when they heard this order? They knew they couldn't do it. They were only going to worship one God, and that's the true God. But here's the problem. All right? Verse 6. You ready? And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So there was a threat. They knew this was coming. The king made a threat. You got to do what I say or else. Now, in our day and age, when we hear the word furnace, we think of this metal box down in our basements that hook up to these round and square big pipes that run around all over the house, right? That's not this kind of furnace. And to show you, my son Sam built something so you'd know what the kind of furnace this was, okay? This furnace is the type they would use to work with metal. And we have a sample. Isn't this cute? This is what the furnaces look like. Now let's get some scale to it. We'll throw a tree here. And we got a bush. Let's see, yeah, about like that. And then we're gonna throw in a couple guards, okay? Now they built them all different sizes. What they would do with these furnaces is they would purify the ore they dig up. So likely this was for iron ore, because back then they had iron stuff. You know, the shoulders had spearheads that were made out of metal, and they had shields made out of metal, and then the people at home would have some pots made out of metal, and they'd make other things, plow, plow bottoms, you know, dig in the ground. They'd make those out of metal, and they learned how to do that. But to make iron stuff, first you gotta dig this iron ore out of the ground, but what you dig out of the ground isn't good enough to make anything out of. you got to separate the bad stuff out of it from the good stuff. And what they would do would build these furnaces. All right? And then inside of them, isn't this cute? It's a little fire. Okay? They'd get a big fire going. Okay? we got a fire going inside our furnace there. Warm up my hands. Okay. Got to be careful I don't breathe the smoke. All right, they got the fire going and they'd get it really hot. And then they'd put in some of that iron ore they got out of the ground. And as they put it in there and heated it up, the bad stuff would start melting. The whole thing would melt and the bad stuff will float to the top. And the good part of the iron you want to use to make your stuff would come down to the bottom. And when they got it melted and got it separated like that, they'd poke a hole down in here in the door. And they, in the sand out here, they dig some troughs, and then they'd have some big sections that those troughs would drain into, and the iron ore would drain out, fill up those spots, and then cool and harden, and then they had stuff the blacksmith can use to make all their metal stuff. All right? So they called these things furnaces, smelting furnaces. And that was Nebuchadnezzar's threat. <coughs> Probably there was already one out there in this area where his image was built and they had it fired up there ready to go and the threat was if you don't worship my image we're going to throw you in here okay so the fire goes in here and the metal goes in there and the smoke comes out so what are these guys going to do Hananiah, Michelle and Azariah they can't worship the image because they know that's against the rules what rule is it against? Hmm? Do you remember? There's ten of them. Yeah, the Ten Commandments God gave Moses up there. Rule number two of those commandments is not to make an idol and worship it. Here was an idol that somebody wanted them to worship. They're saying we can't do that. So, first of all, they just tried to ignore it. They played the music at the place. And um, everybody else bows down and worships the idol. It becomes an idol then when they worship it. But Shadrach, you know, we also know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't do that. Maybe they tried to find a discreet place to do it. I don't know. But some of the other guys there, some of the other people that were called to this big team building thing came along 
and they talked to the king. And they said, oh, king, didn't you make this command that if you don't worship my idol, we're going to throw you in the furnace? And the king said, yes, I did. And they said, well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, see, they called them by their Babylonian names there. They didn't do it. These Jews, these Hebrews we brought out, see, they're not obeying you, king. They don't like you. And they're not doing it. But the king knew these guys. And he didn't want to hurt them, so he calls them in in front of him. Aha, we got this right here, okay? Move this little guard over here, the guard over here, and here is King Nebuchadnezzar on his throne. We don't know if he had a throne that day or not, but we'll pretend he did. There he is on his throne, okay? And then here we have Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo. There's the guards, herding them up. All right. <laughs> they get called in front of the king. And the king says, hey, guys, I heard you didn't bow down in front of my idol. Now, I don't know what happened. Maybe you didn't hear it. Something's going on. But I'll tell you what. We'll do it again. We'll have them play their instruments. And if you guys fall down and worship my idol, no problem. We'll just forget the whole thing. More or less, that's what he said. Okay? What do you think these guys are thinking about now? Fiery furnace. King that's kind of being good to him at the moment. And an idol. This was their, what did I call it? Their difficult situation. You ever been in a difficult situation? I've been a couple in my life. Where it's really easy not to do what you want God to do what you know God wants you to do. And that's the position these three guys here were in. If we just bow down and worship the idol, everything will be okay. So what do you think they did? They had a second chance. Well, they didn't take it. Um, they said, King, you could read it, Thou has made a decree, every man. Da, 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 da. Okay, verse 16. Daniel 3, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said, O King Nebuchadnezzar. See, they're still being polite. They're still giving as much honor to the king as they should. We are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so... Our God, who is able to serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, because remember, they don't know the end of the story like we do. They really didn't know what was going to happen here. But if not, be it known to thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image thou hast set up. So they didn't know what was going to happen to them. All right? They didn't know how God was going to solve this. And they still decided to obey God, even though they were in this difficult situation. And one of the censures is, if we back up to verse 15, all right? Beep, 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 beep. Verse 15, look at the last phrase, okay? If you start at the very last comma, in verse 15, when the king was talking to him, he said, And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? As if to say, I am more powerful than your God. Look at all my soldiers. Look at my great idol. Look at my fiery furnace. If you guys think you can stand up against me, we'll show you wrong. We'll show you who's really in charge here. No God is going to be able to save you from me. But yet the guys turned that down. They politely declined the second chance. How do you think that went over with the king? Not very good, huh? Matter of fact, 
Let's look at verse 19 now. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and his form and vintage was changed. So now he's hopping mad. All right, he's a hopping mad king. His whole attitude towards these three guys that he was trying to get off the hook changes. He's not putting up with this, he thinks. All right, against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they heat the fiery furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Seven times. I did a little research. Okay? What temperature do you think iron ore melts at? How hot do you have to be before this metal melts into a liquid? And you can separate the bad stuff from the good stuff. All right? One of the things I looked up was said 2,282 degrees Fahrenheit. All right? A warm summer day is like... 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If it gets up to 100 degrees, which it does sometimes, that's quite hot. It's almost unbearable for most of us to live with. All right. We will catch on fire well before 1,000 degrees. But the melting temperature at being 2,282 degrees this says he ordered it seven times hotter. So do the math. Anybody got a calculator there? You push two, two, eight, two times seven. And you'll get something very close to 16,000 degrees. Now, I don't know if they could actually do that. Maybe the king gave that order and they did all they could and they couldn't get anywhere close. But anyways, it was quite hot. All right, so he got it ordered. It is steaming hot. I imagine the stones were even red. And they took the guys and they tied them up. Did you see this right here? We got cute little handcuffs out from there to show that they're tied up because they tied them up in their hats and their stockings and everything else. So here's our guards. All right, These, he's tied up too. And he's tied up, okay. And then to get up to the top, you need a ladder. Bum, bum, bum. Put the ladder over here. We'll take our guard here. Go carry one guy up. <laughs> ah! All right. Next guy. <laughs> and then the last guy. <laughs> now, that's not the way it happened, though. Because the guys that carried him up there, the thing was so hot that the guards that followed the orders to throw them in died of the heat. That's just how hot, just being up there on the top. I wonder if the ladder caught on fire. <clears throat> All right. So these guys are dead. We got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. It should have been like poof, and they were gone. That's not what happened. Because you see here, the king, oops, he lost his helmet. There we go. Put his throne back. The king wanted to see what was going on. So he's standing out here as close as he can get because of the heat. He's probably covering his face so his face doesn't get like a sunburn from the intense heat. And he's looking inside the bottom door. It's a door where you put the fire in and the iron ore. Okay, he's looking in there and he sees something. Let's read about it in verses 24 and 25. Okay, chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste and spake unto his counselors. Oh, sorry, I don't have any counselors left. Did we not cast three men into the midst of the fire? And they answered unto the king. They said, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men 
walking around in the midst of the fire. Okay, the 16,000 degree fire. Yeah. Do you walk around in a fire? No, you jump out of it quick. They were just walking around in there. They have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So what's going on here? The ropes they tied him up with, they burnt off. But the guys aren't hurt. Can you imagine being inside of a flame and not being hurt? And there was somebody else there. We have a picture of it here. <clears throat> All right, there's the king looking inside this furnace. There's our three guys, whether you want to call them Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then there's a fourth guy. And who did Nebuchadnezzar say it looked like? He said it looked like the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Well, <clears throat> here in us, our age, we call him Jesus. That's the name he had when he came to earth. This was before Jesus became Jesus. This was God the Son before he became Jesus. Before he also became a man and walked on earth. And he was in there helping these guys out. Because of him being in there, they weren't being hurt inside the fire. So the king calls them out. Unfortunately, I don't have a way to get my little Lego minifigures out of the oven. So you'll just have to work with me, okay? The king calls them out and talks to them. He's now scared to death. Because these guys we know are already superstitious. And he's come to the conclusion... This is a God you don't want to mess with. You leave this God alone. So he calls him out. <clears throat> and he makes a new law. All right. <clears throat> Which brings glory to God. We're going to read 28 and 29. All right. Daniel chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke... And said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent an angel and delivered his servants that trusted him, and have changed the king's word. See that? God didn't care what the king said. God's going to do what he's going to do. And they yielded their bodies that they might not worship any god except their own god. <laughs> and in verse 29, we see he makes a decree. That you can't say anything against these guys' God. You can't say anything against the real God. Because Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to mess with this guy. Not this God. The other gods, AQ, Negro, that's a different story. But this God, better leave him alone. <clears throat> and that's how God got glory in this situation. We're going to look at another one. <clears throat> Which... It's just the next chapter, chapter 4. <clears throat> this chapter is kind of strange in the book of Daniel. All right? Daniel has been writing this book, <clears throat> and he writes it in the third person, which means he doesn't use the pronouns I or me or myself. He just calls himself in there like he's talking about another person. <clears throat> but this chapter is actually written by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. He wrote this letter and sent it out over his kingdom, and Daniel took it and copied it and wrote it in here. He might have changed it from Arabic to Hebrew. We'll see. <coughs> I'm not up on that. All right. So this is a story Nebuchadnezzar's telling, because he learned to listen. So I am calling this part the Great Lesson. All right. And it talks, starts off, Nebuchadnezzar has a disturbing dream. Now we could read about it, but I'm just going to draw it. All right? <clears throat> he dreams about a tree. All right, let's see here. You know what we got, though? We don't have any green leaves. Ever seen black leaves on a tree? I don't know. All right. Here is our great tree. All right. <clears throat> and it was a giant tree. 
It reached up to heaven. It covered the whole earth. And then <clears throat> birds came along and they were nesting in it. There's a birdie. Try to decide which end of that bird's going forward. There's another bird. Here's a bird. Nests. Oh, they got to have a nest. Okay. So the birds were living in the branches, <coughs> and the animals were down here. Let's see here. I think that's a deer. I don't know. How about a bunny rabbit? Give them a little cottontail. Some ears. Okay. I think I can do a cow. I don't know. Uh -uh. What do you think? A cow? I don't know. But the animals came and lived underneath the tree, and it had fruit. One of my favorite fruits from a tree is an apple. All right. <clears throat> So in his dream, King Nebuchadnezzar saw this great tree. Then guess what? Someone starts talking to him. He calls him a seer from God. Some sort of an angel. In his dream, gives a command. And the command that's given is, chop down the tree. Leave the stump. I shouldn't have erased it. All right. Leave the stump. Take that tree you cut down. Break its branches off. Take the leaves. Scatter them off. And take the fruit. Throw it all away. The birds have to find some other place. Oh, there we go. No birdie. The animals have to go somewhere else. And then around this tree stump, put a fence. It says put a, an iron band on it. We think that might mean a fence. Because we're going to protect the stump. <clears throat> All right. Then it gets personal. We're going to read that section. What this angelic being in his dream said. <clears throat> um, yep. <clears throat> we'll look at the last part of verse 15. Chapter 4, verse 15. All right, da, da 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 See, it switches from talking about the tree, talking about something else. So we read the first part, never let's leave the stump and the roots and the iron band, okay? Now, <clears throat> after that second comma in the verse, I'm going to start with the word in. So Daniel 4, 15. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. <clears throat> Going on to verse 16. Let the heart be changed from man's, and let it be a beast heart be given unto him. Let seven times pass over him. That sounds strange, but what it means is, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to stop living like a man. I mean, you won't be king. You won't even be a man anymore. <clears throat> We're going to change you into a beast. And you're going to live seven years as a beast in the field. <clears throat> you're not going to talk. You're not going to read anything. You're not going to change your clothes. Your hair is going to grow wild. 
<laughs> your fingernails are going to grow off like claws and you're going to live a life of an animal until you finally realize <laughs> who God is and what he means. So that was the dream. Nebuchadnezzar had it. He didn't know what it meant. He called in his wise men and his <clears throat> sorcerer guys. Tell me what this dream means. None of them could. And he calls in Daniel. So Daniel comes in. Because Daniel had done another dream in chapter 2 that we don't look at. And he hears what Nebuchadnezzar says his dream is. And for an hour he's not answering it. Because it's so scary. <clears throat> it takes him an hour to get it together. And the king has to beg him to tell him what it means. And he says, oh king, and we wish it was for your enemies and not for you. <clears throat> but he says, <clears throat> you're going to be the one that goes wild. God's going to take away your kingdom. You're going to be acting like an animal for seven years until you realize who God is. That he's the mighty one. And then he begs the king, Daniel does, to repent, <clears throat> turn away from what he's doing, and the king doesn't listen. A year later, he's walking in his capital city, Babylon, which is probably quite an impressive city. And um, he looks around, he says, wow, look at this city. Wow, 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 wow. I built this myself because I'm such a powerful king. This city is good enough for me. And I'm the mighty king. And that's what had happened. <clears throat> he started acting like an animal. Living out in the wild. <clears throat> we see him here. His fingernails start growing out like claws. His hair grows wild. He's eating grass like cows do. All right. <clears throat> And he did that for seven years. And then one day he looks up to heaven and says, Aha! God gave him his senses back. God is the true God. He is the one that's in charge. I'm just a man. I might be a king. I'm still just a man. And God's the all-powerful one. And then he got it back. He got back his intelligence. He started living like a king again. His people came back to him that used to call on him, his advisors. And he takes over the kingdom again. <clears throat> and then he wrote this chapter here in Daniel. Let's look at how he summed this up. All right. Daniel chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 37. This is what Nebuchadnezzar said right there <clears throat> at the end of chapter 4. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that talk about <clears throat> and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. It says, I now worship the true God. Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king in a country <clears throat> all the way from God's chosen people, Israel, has now turned to God. God got the glory. <clears throat> so we see, even though God had to shut down his countries, there's one country he had all the promises to for a while because they were sinners. God's still getting his glory. Hopefully in our lives we can find a way to give God the glory in what we're doing. And to do that we have to obey him. We can't be proud like Nebuchadnezzar was. <clears throat> and our next lesson we're going to see his family didn't follow though. And we'll see some difficulty of that. But for today, let's pray. We'll see you again next time. If you see me in one of the services, be sure to come up and say, Hi, Mr. Guyman. And I'll say hi to you because we miss not being able to be together. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. <clears throat> we thank you what we can learn here and what Daniel was taught while he was serving you. And pray that we'd find ways to honor and glorify you too with our lives in the things that come up and in the situations we're in. In thy name, amen. <clears throat>